the mayor and city council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Dunn. Clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlin? Here. Vice Mayor Edwards? Here. Councilmember Finn? Here. Councilmember Butena? Here. Councilmember Binsbacher? Here. Councilmember Hunt? Here. And Councilmember Dunn? Here. And Council Youth Liaison Piero? Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of October 26th, 2021. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a presentation. Veterans of Foreign Wars post-2135 sponsorship, Senator John McCain, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Plaza. And I will begin by turning it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne. Thank you, Mayor. And we uh, will pass it over to John Sefton, our Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities Director, who will introduce members of VFW post-2135 and present uh, a PowerPoint for all of you and a short video. Excellent. Mayor, Council, thank you so much. It's an honor for me to be able to present tonight and to welcome a couple of very special people into our uh, venue here tonight. First, I'd like to recognize, gentlemen, would you mind standing? Quarter, or Commander Manny Beltran, Quartermaster Adjutant Larry Carey, Junior Vice Commander Dwayne Danner, who also serves on our Veterans Memorial Board, and our chairman of the Veterans Memorial Board, Tad Snedeker. Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome, all of you. So one of the most important things that we do within our community is recognize our veterans. We have done that phenomenally with our expansion of the Peoria Veterans Memorial. More than just a place, it's a true destination. The improvements that we've made over the past five years have been phenomenal and, and widely recognized. It's not just a place for us to do our annual events for Veterans Memorial Day. It's a place for the community to come together. This is an example of how veterans supporting veterans on a day that nobody really knew about where they re redid an entire vehicle and dedicated that to a homeless veteran right in our own destination, our Veterans Memorial. We also celebrated our Flag Day and Armed Forces Day this year, demonstrating yet another phenomenal use of our expanded areas. Now, I'd like to also show a quick video of the sponsored area of the Senator John McCain Vietnam Veterans Memorial Plaza and an introduction of the VFW. I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. I loved it, not just for the many comforts of life here, I loved it for its decency, for its faith, and the wisdom, justice, and goodness of its people. I loved it because it was not just a place, but an idea, a cause worth fighting for. I was never the same again. I wasn't my own man anymore. I was my country's. 
We got the Huey helicopter, and that was outstanding. We had uh, a lot of people here that had a lot of tears in their eyes when they would come up and touch that helicopter because it would bring up memories from the past and kind of console them, I guess, and tell them it was okay. for its faith and the wisdom, justice, and goodness of its people. I loved it because it was not just a place, but an idea, a cause worth fighting for. I was never the same again. I wasn't my own man anymore. I was my country's. We got the Huey helicopter, and that was outstanding. We had uh, a lot of people here that had a lot of tears in their eyes when they would come up and touch that helicopter because it would bring up memories from the past and kind of console them, I guess, and tell them it was okay. Adjutant Larry Carey. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here before you this evening. <clears throat> the VFW here in Peoria was chartered on the 8th of August in 1985. We have always met in the community center just up the street, and it's been a real pleasure to uh, be able to do that. Uh, the post is trying to work with all different uh, veterans, okay? However, about probably at this stage, about 85% of the post is Vietnam vets. Um, and when you're young and you got a young family, it's pretty hard to uh, take that extra time to be involved, and yet they are members. So uh, we welcome those into our fold and uh, hope that we can serve them better. Our only fundraising really is through the sale of buddy poppies. And I don't mean sale, I mean we take donations for the buddy poppies, uh, which I believe each one of you has in front of you. Uh, we do that and, and use that as our main fundraiser. And, and since 2018, except for last year, which of course we all know what happened there, <clears throat> we've raised $25,000, and uh, this year we'll be out at Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Uh, we have two days, Friday and Saturday, uh, at seven different uh, prize stores in the Peoria, Sun City, Sun City West area. Uh, we make donations every year to, uh, most of them are the grocery cards for $50, that we donate to, uh, some of them go to the community center here to their outreach program, and then the others go out to Luke Air Force Base. They have an airman's support uh, group out there. And we also donate to several uh, businesses, um, I won't say businesses, several veterans 
uh, help organizations such as Soldier's Best Friend, which is where they train the dogs for uh, helping the uh, uh, veterans. The James Walton Home, which is for uh, the homeless women veterans. And then the Fisher House, which is in Tucson, which that is where all the veterans go for uh, cardiac and for cancer treatment. And so by supporting that home, we give their families a place to live while they're down there getting the treatments. So that's what the VFW does. And uh, appreciate your support. And we're so pleased to be able to support the city with our, uh, the donation. Thank you. Mr. Carey. Thank you, Mr. Carey. <laughs> On behalf of the Peoria City Council and all of our members of the city, this is a, such a generous donation. We cannot thank you enough, not only for what you have done for the veterans who are going to be able to sit in this bench and, and enjoy the, the um, John McCain Vietnam Veterans Memorial, but also for your service for our country. We, we thank you. We are truly indebted. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful way to start a council meeting. We will now move on to our consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed and or discussed by city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If the presiding officer receives a timely notice of a request for removal, an item may be removed from the consent agenda for consideration on the regular agenda. Mr. Finn. Yes, Madam Mayor. I, I would like to uh, pull item 8C from the consent agenda, please. Thank you. Ms. Dunn, did you have one? Mike Finn read my mind, 8C as well. Okay, thank you. All right. Is there a motion on the consent agenda with the exception of item 8C? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. The council please vote. Councilmember Binsbacher, how do you vote? Aye. And it passes unanimously. All right, we will now move on to item 8C. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. And this item re refers to uh, the funding that was part of the coronavirus relief package known as the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. And as you recall, the city has been identified as uh, receiving 20670000 allocation in two different tranches, uh, which that first portion has been received. A prior action by the City Council was on June 15th, where the City Council accepted the grant funding awarded and then approved a budget amendment in the amount of $5 million for various ARPA fund accounts. I'm going to pass it over to our Interim Chief Financial Officer, uh, Kevin Burke, to discuss this agenda item. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I guess rather than going too far in too many different directions, is there a particular question that I might focus on that either of you might have? I, I pulled, um, I know that um, Council Member Dunn had some questions as well. I just wanted to get some more information on this. I think everyone, it's not a surprise that we're huge supporters of public, public safety up here in this dais. So um, I just want to get a little bit more information on kind of what was happening with this for, for the public, if, if that would not be too much trouble. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, Council Member Finn. Uh, again, as uh, Manager Tyne described, this is part of really the third federal stimulus program uh, as a result of COVID. This particular one, the uh, staff presented back in June kind of how the first $10 million that was received in May was recommended to be divided. And so we had $5 million that council and mayor and council approved as a budget amendment, uh, really focused on a number of uh, community services, you know, rent, utility assistance, mortgage assistance, business assistance. And at that time, it was noted that we would be back to discuss those areas associated with revenue losses caused by COVID. And so this is a particular uh, section of the ARPA bill that says there were 
we know that there were losses caused to your revenue stream as a municipality due to COVID. And so this revenue is intended to backfill that or make up that difference. And so there is a very specific formula, the Department of Treasury sent out instructions on how to calculate uh, the lost revenue. And essentially you went back to your last complete fiscal year before COVID and you said, okay, this is what our revenues were looking at. And then they give you a formula that says um, kind of what should have happened had COVID not occur. And that gives you a formula to calculate lost revenue. That equaled $4.3 million for calendar year 20, which is the first year that they have us do this exercise. That 4.3 million, uh, we are directing towards public safety um, because any, any government services, not any, but they have a definition of government services within that public safety is one of the defined government services. And they said that is eligible to direct use of this lost revenue. And so because public service has been so impacted by COVID, uh, it seemed only appropriate to direct those expenses to them um, in this case. You know, if I may, just to, to elaborate, uh, we know that during this uh, last pandemic that our fire, medical, and police operations obviously took the brunt of much of the activity in, in so many different ways. Uh, what better way to identify the loss revenue and allocate appropriately is to recognize some of that additional cost that we have received from all of their hard work. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I, I spoke to you earlier today um, about the, the formula which you just referenced and um, also the uh, five million that I talked about uh, um, and you were saying re redirecting uh, uh, the 400 and, uh, I'm sorry, not 400, uh, $4,320,425 uh, from the um, general fund and uh, redirecting the ARPA funds towards that. Is that correct so far, our yes, conversation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I understand, though, uh, that uh, a lot of this money is to um, uh, pay for overtime uh, that police and, and fire um, uh, because of staffing shortages. Um, and I wanted to kind of get your take on that, and I had a few questions as If well. I may, I, I think it's important to note that this is not just for overtime for staffing shortages by any stretch. I think that overtime is used for a number of different reasons in police and fire, whether it's going to be for shift extensions, whether it's going to be court appearances, holidays, backfill of absences, mobilization, certainly during the COVID era when we had absences as a result of sickness, there was a need to fill in on those specific things. So this is not in itself related to vacancies. Want to make sure that's clear. We've had some conversations on that recently. I think we've heard that we're very fortunate that we don't have a significant vacancy issue in police or in fire medical at this point. Okay, so um, on October 13th, I had uh, asked for um, the um, <clears throat> full-time employees uh, for police and fire, and I did receive uh, the and I, uh, received the information from fire. I have not to date re uh, received that um, from uh, the police department, um, but I did uh, ask that. And then um, I think I just had spoke to our chief, and about a week ago, ago he um, did uh, turn over the, the, the information uh, to Mr. Uh, Granger. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm concerned with is um, in June 20th, in June 2020, there was a council meeting and I asked our city manager and uh, Commander Doug Steele um, why we were down uh, 26 police officers, at which time I was told by um, our city manager and Commander Steele that was, uh, police was fully staffed and they called uh, up the um, HR director at that time to publicly verify the claim of being fully staffed. Additionally, on Ms. May Dunn, 20th, Ms. Dunn, 2020. Can I interrupt you for just one moment? Um, Point of order, Mayor. Respectfully, I was elected to serve my district and ask questions. And I am on Ms. Point. Hickman. Yeah, I would, I would just like to interject here that I think we're getting far afield from the agenda item, which is a budget amendment and approving the allocation of um, ARPA funding 
for uh, public safety. This does have to do with the, the budget amendment. And so, uh, point of order, I should be able to ask these questions for my constituents. You must stay within the agenda-sized uh, item here. Ms. Hickman, are we getting off? Or it has I to do with additional budget amendment or redirecting general funds with ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. I just, I would just, again, caution you to just try and stay towards the budget item and not uh, going back and, and talking about um, items that may or may not have been said in previous council meetings. So it, uh, additionally, um, I was told uh, that uh, funding uh, to backstop these uh, operations um, to support uh, our operations. I also um, have asked if, if COVID, uh, if crime was up due to COVID. And I was told because people are staying home, crime was down with the exception of uh, domestic violence. My question is, if we were fully staffed, why are we running so many overtime hours? I have fires right here information that I would receive for uh, this. Um, and 99 hours were the total overtime hours for COVID out of the 46,306 uh, hours. Um, again, if we were fully staffed, we wouldn't have these overtime hours running rampant. And I'm ashamed to say that, you know, people, when, uh, when you're overworked with overtime hours, um, it c causes a great health and safety concern, not only to our public servants that, are, you know, our police and fire, but all to, also to um, our, our general public. It's literally blood money. I want to state again, we do need to fund our positions uh, for police. We are short. We are short in fire. And, you know, to, to put this under uh, COVID only, and, and again, I have figures here, half of the figures, it, it doesn't show COVID. Um, and I did ask the questions. So that's um, the comments that I have to, to make tonight. But I do want to make sure that we do get these uh, um, positions funded, and we should have uh, quite a while ago, in my opinion. That's all I have. Thank you. Respectfully. Thank you. Is there a motion on item 8C? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please vote. Yes. Councilman Binsbacher. And it passes unanimously. We will be able to pass along those ARPA funds to public safety. We will now move on to item 11R. This is our regular agenda and new business. Intergovernmental agreement, State of Arizona, 67th Avenue, Pinnacle Peak to Happy Valley Road. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And, and we have with us Thomas Atkins, our Intergovernmental Affairs Director, to present on this item. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tyne, for this opportunity to present on this, what I think is a good news item. Uh, so before you this evening is a proposed intergovernmental agreement between the City of Peoria and the State of Arizona. This pertains to drainage and road improvements along 67th Avenue between Happy Valley Road and Pinnacle Peak Road. I'm going to be providing a, a, just a very brief overview of the project, um, but we do have the resident expert, our city engineer, Adina Lunn, on standby should you have any project-specific questions. And then I'm going to cover the sort of uh, nuts and bolts of the IGA with ADOT. So by way of background, um, 67th Avenue between Happy Valley and Pinnacle Peak Road is in the northern part of our city. This serves as the border between both Peoria, Phoenix, and to the south, the city of Glendale. This really is a gateway to the Northwest Valley and to the city of Peoria. The roadway was originally constructed by Maricopa County, uh, but was subsequently annexed by the city in 2007 whereupon we added an additional travel lane in each direction. However, during that period of time, uh, this area has seen tremendous growth. Traffic uh, volume has more than doubled, 
And during major rain events, we are seeing some uh, significant flooding that presents a public safety uh, challenge to uh, residents and surrounding businesses. So to address these challenges, the city has uh, adopted in its capital improvement program uh, several projects to address these issues. Um, but overall, this project is very, very large and um, rather complex. Uh, this, because it involves multiple jurisdictions, uh, that adds another wrinkle to it. Uh, the acquisition of right-of-way is always a complex and sensitive issue. And then, of course, we have to relocate several utilities, which is always a, a fun challenge for everybody. So this slide highlights some of the improvements and upgrades um, that are contained within our capital improvement program. I'm not going to hit on every one of these, but I would like to call out a few significant ones. Uh, most notably, we are going to see some uh, very significant improvements to the drainage network uh, that connects to the overall regional system. This uh, should mitigate and address uh, all of the flooding issues, some of which you see in this photo here. Uh, also, we are going to expand the roadway to an add an additional travel lane in each direction, along with some bike lanes. And there are several other safety improvements, including raised medians and uh, lighted sidewalks that are ADA compliant. I'm going to go ahead and pause here if anybody has any project-specific questions before we dive into the, uh, the, the meat of this presentation. Any questions? No, All right. Go right ahead. So, as with any large project, um, funding and cost is always sort of forefront of mind here. Uh, this is very large and significant, and with these types of projects, particularly ones that are um, that sort of hit beyond our borders that are sort of super regional in nature like this one. Staff is pretty aggressive in trying to pursue external grant and intergovernmental revenue opportunities to sort of augment and potentially offset some of the city's uh, financial exposure. So beyond the original uh, 11.6 million or so that the city has committed, staff has also received the commitment from the Maricopa <laughs> County Flood Control District to contribute an additional $10 million to the project. Staff is also working with our regional partners uh, and surrounding jurisdictions to get some additional financial help, and we will most certainly need their help when it comes to right-of-way acquisition beyond the city's borders. But given the large and um, very significant impact of this project, um, staff was also taking the opportunity to pursue a rather unique funding opportunity and that is partnering with some of our state champions down at the Capitol uh, for some possible state funding. So uh, going back a few years ago, um, the city began working with Senator David Livingston, who was then serving as the Senate Transportation Chairman. Um, the senator had taken an interest in this project and had offered to sponsor legislation to provide a one-time state appropriation to help expedite this critical project and the improvements that we needed. So in the following session in 2020, Senator Livingston ran a bill to provide some funding for this project. Led by Mayor Carlett, the city advocated and uh, lobbied for the bill's passage through several committees, met with numerous members. It's a rather arduous process to get any bill passed, and any bill that has a dollar sign attached to it is that much more complicated and um, challenging to get through. So through numerous committees, we, um, we were able to get the bill passed with near unanimous support. However, during 2020, as with everything else, um, the legislature kind of came to a screeching halt with the pandemic and our funding request was um, shelved. The good news uh, is that uh, Representative Frank Carroll, who is the House Transportation Chairman, uh, opted to pick up the reins and authored legislation to provide the state appropriation for us. He uh, was tireless in his efforts at the legislature to get support, and again, with the mayor's help in testifying this time via Zoom and other means, we were able to get the bill through. And I'm very happy to report that after countless uh, hearings and meetings and all sorts of uh, friendly arm twisting, Representative Carroll was able to get included in the state capital uh, budget an appropriation to the city for eight and a half million dollars for these critical improvements along 67th Avenue. 
This is a truly significant achievement for Representative Carroll, all of our legislative champions, which included the entire Peoria delegation who signed on as co-sponsors, um, and of course for the entire city team that's been working on this project for many years, not just this piece. So this brings us to the IGA before us tonight. Um, this, uh, Adina has told me, is one of the shortest IGAs she's ever seen from ADOT, and it's fairly straightforward. Um, the way it works is if approved, um, and if we approve the IGA, uh, that will authorize ADOT to issue a warrant to transfer the state appropriation of $8.5 million to the city of Peoria. Our portion of the agreement is that we will abide by the state budget law that says we will use the appropriated funds for the 67th Avenue improvements and abide by the uh, records retentions and the sort of normal um, uh, run-of-the-mill stuff that's in those IGAs. And that's kind of it. Uh, so it's nice and tidy. Uh, so listed here, um, should the council opt to approve the IGA, um, is sort of an estimated timeline of some key milestones that we can expect with this major project. Um, again, because of the large scale of this project and its far-reaching impact and the number of jurisdictions involved and all those things, these dates uh, represent staff's best estimates for these milestones. However, they are subject to change as um, issues pop up. Also in this uh, slide is something for any viewers that are watching and would like to receive regular updates on this project. The city does have a project website at 67thavpeoriaaz.com that provides additional information on the specific improvements and some other timeline information. So with that, that brings us to the staff recommendation, which is to approve the IGA with ADOT for the 67th Avenue improvements, and also to approve a budget amendment in the amount of $8.5 million from the general fund contingency account to the 67th Avenue Pinnacle Peak Road Widening CIP Project Fund. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, are there any questions? Um, that was a great presentation, I have to say, and it, it took so much shorter period of time than it actually took to get this, to get this money in the state budget, having to deal with, you know, a shortened session one year and then the next year starting all over again from scratch. You know, it, it's, for anyone at home, it, it, you just don't normally get these kinds of projects into the state budget. And I would just like to thank um, Thomas and his, and his uh, staff for making sure that those relationships that we have are um, knowledgeable about what Peoria needs and how this road is, is really a regional transportation corridor. The people along those roads are suffering from the, the effects of flooding that comes from uh, multiple, multiple cities. Uh, and affects Peoria residents. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why this should be done, but that doesn't always mean that it will get done. In this case, it did get done. It's a major accomplishment, and I really want to thank you, and, and I certainly want to thank our delegation uh, for caring so much about Peoria residents. It's a, it's, it's a big milestone for us. And so with that, uh, is there a motion? We have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. Council Member Binsbacher? I vote yes. Thank you. It passes unanimously. Thanks again. Right. Item number 12R is budget amendment and contract approval, rock solid technologies. Mr. Time. Thank you, Mayor. And Sharon Robertson, our assistant to the city manager, will present on this item. Thank you, Mr. Time. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to be back in front of you again to once again talk about a potential citizen relationship management system implementation, or CRM as it's most commonly called here at the city. We are excited to offer a smart cities technology initiative that brings Peoria into the 21st century, 
albeit 10 years into the 21st century, but that's okay. Uh, with the, or 20 years, <laughs> sorry. With the way we interact with our residents. At its core, citizen relationship management is all of the activities, strategies, and technologies used to manage interactions with our current and our future residents. You can see on the slide here all the potential ways that citizens could connect with the city with this new type of system. So any kind of mobile device, texting capability, which would be a, a brand new thing for us, um, website, and we can also capture it through calls and in-person visits. A CRM system can act as a one-stop shop for Peoria residents, integrating all the city's enterprise resource planning software. For example, a resident spots a street light that's out. They can either log on to our website, they can open the app that they've downloaded on their mobile device, they can send us a text, they can stop in and tell us about it, or they can give us a call. Any of those means will be entered into this new system and it will interact with systems we already have in place at the city with two-way communication back and forth. So it will provide real-time updates to city staff as well as residents on service request opening, status reports, um, anticipated timeline for resolution, and then ultimate closure um, with all those messages delivered back to the resident if they opt in for that service. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. A CRM helps the city to learn about its citizens and their needs. It provides reporting. It provides trends that can be easily spotted and tracked. We can use the dashboard data and create customized reports to spot issues early and take proactive action. Early solicitations of CRM vendors identified a system purchase amount of $65,000 and ongoing costs of $40,000. Council approved these amounts in the mid-year budget adjustment on January 5th of this year. Systems, unfortunately, are notoriously difficult to budget in advance. Only when the project is completely scoped out and it's determined all of the components and the licenses that will be needed do we get a clear picture of the actual cost. Following the RFP process and submissions from 10 different vendors, it became apparent that Peoria needed more budget to support the kind of system that will truly be a game changer for delivering service to our citizens. After a committee of department heads reviewed all the vendor submissions and held two rounds of interviews, demonstrations, and contract review, Rock Solid Technologies was selected as the best vendor to deliver the kind of service, tools, and product features that Peoria needs and at the best price. We found the sweet spot with the company between deliverables and cost, but it does require more budget authority beyond what was earmarked in January. Rock Solid has over 25 years of experience specifically in CRM systems and specializing in local government operations. They have built CRM systems for over 175 municipalities. We reached out for reference checks to a lot of these cities and received very favorable reviews. So we feel confident in our selection of this vendor. As the CRM is adopted across the system and absorbed into the Peoria culture, more systems should be able to be replaced, optimizing the budget, save, giving us savings, and um, enhancing our ability to deliver more efficient services. So with that said, tonight what we're asking council for is to approve a five-year contract with Rock Solid Technologies to build and operate a citizen relationship management system, to approve a one-time budget amendment of $74,000 for our first year costs of implementation and operation, and an ongoing amount will be included in the FY23 budget process of $69,000. With that, are there any questions that you have? Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Sharon, so great report. I mean, you know, I, I use Peoria Reporter quite a bit, and it had a little bit to be desired, and so it, I'm glad to see that we're moving forward with something different. Um, when is the estimated time frame for um, implementation? Uh, with, with Council's approval tonight, we will kick this off tomorrow um, with Rock Solid, uh, have a 
major kickoff in about six weeks with all the departments that would be involved in this and then start architecting the system and they tell us we should be able to have a system up and running within three to four months. Okay. So hopefully sometime early next year. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Dunn? Uh, yes, uh, thanks Sharon, that was a good presentation. Um, I, I, John had mentioned Peoria reports, is this replacing that? Peoria Reporter is one of the things that would definitely be sunsetted with this new system. And, and then um, how, what, we're gathering information and data from our residents. What's the oversight on that as far as, you know, our data storage? Um, because, you know, in case, uh, you know, things get hacked or, or whatever, what, what's oversight on that? There are um, many security uh, features built into this system. Um, it is hosted off-site in the cloud, but it is in the government cloud. So it is hosted within uh, the United States boundaries. Um, there are assurances within our contract for data security, and IT has reviewed um, the entire presentation from Rock Solid and is very confident in their ability to deliver uh, a secure product for us and house all of our data securely. My last question is, how many other cities in Arizona have this particular pro uh, program? Um, Mayor, Councilmember Dunn, in Arizona, there are currently five cities uh, in the state that have chosen this particular vendor. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Hi, good night. Um, I was going to ask the same thing as Vice Mayor, but I just was wondering who you are targeting in general. Um, I know for a fact that Savannah and I's generation would find this really easy to use. I was just wondering if maybe the rest of the city or the other citizens would have a hard time adjusting this, or how would you kind of promote this to everybody else, to all the other residents? Uh, excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, and, th and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to maintain the ability to have telephone calls and um, walk-in visits captured in this system. The staff will enter those uh, interactions for those residents. Um, but to capture some of the younger generation is why we wanted a system that added texting capabilities and a mobile app. So hopefully between all the omni channels that are available for contact within this, we will capture every skill set in every generation. Um, but we will definitely promote this through all our social media channels, our website, um, neighborhood meetings, that kind of thing. Get the word out there. Thank you. I think it's a great idea, Thank you. especially for the youth. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Seeing none, do we have a motion on item 12R? I'll motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Council Member Binsbacher, how do you vote? I vote yes. And it passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor and Council. All right. The next item on the agenda is call to the public on non-agenda items. If you wish to address the City Council, please complete a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium. Because of the requirements of the state's open meeting law, the City Council is not authorized to discuss or take action on any issue raised by public comment until a later meeting. Please be aware your comments will be noted. And I have a speaker request form from Leslie McMorrow. If you would kindly come to the podium, state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Leslie McMorrow. I live at 11310 North 80th Drive. My comments tonight are regarding the October 12th study session. One of the presentations given that night was concerning a temporary mobile placemaking location in some empty lots in Old Town Peoria that the city is prepared to spend $260,000 for the beginning stage. Once all four stages are complete, the city will spend nearly three quarters of a million dollars to set up something that is temporary. However, in Deputy Director Gregory's part of the presentation, she mentioned that there are developers that are currently interested in Old Town. Are we willing to spend this kind of money just to possibly turn around a few months later and remove everything at an additional cost? I like the notion of having a placemaking location. It's a fantastic idea to bring people to the area and encourage them to stay and explore the retail and entertainment offerings available. 
However, I believe they should be placed in currently existing parks instead of parcels that will eventually be developed. Osuna Park is steps away from the location of these parcels, and Centennial Park is not that much farther. Considering the fact they both currently have the infrastructure and maintenance schedule in place to water and care for the foliage, taxpayers should not bear the cost of creating infrastructure for something that is going to be broken down once the parcels are eventually sold. The city's focus should be on selling and developing these parcels to bring shopping and businesses to the area that will help with tax revenue instead of spending taxpayer money indefinitely. And I say indefinitely because unlike the notion that this is a one-time cost, which I have heard some people say, there is going to be an additional cost for continued maintenance and upkeep, which will, by necessity, be a higher upkeep cost for foliage than for maintaining gravel. I understand that in the grand scope of things, this may not seem like a great deal of money. However, the concerning thing to me about this conversation is that also in the October 12th study session, we learned the city is losing employees to other cities, in many cases because of pay, causing some of the departments to become short-staffed. In my opinion, it would be more fiscally responsible to reallocate the money for the temporary placemaking park towards retaining and recruiting qualified employees. Instead of a short-term vanity project, this money could pay for additional police officers or help hire 911 dispatchers or trash truck drivers or any of the other departments that are short-staffed and likely turning in high overtime costs. Among the city's core values is ethics and accountability, so I will leave you with this question. Is it really ethical to create yet another park while allowing city departments and employees to be stretched thin, also indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you. And I have one more speaker request form from Mr. John Forsyth. If you would kindly state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak, sir. Good evening. I'm John Forsyth. I reside at 27605 North 85th Drive in the Mesquite District. I'm here tonight again to talk about um, police accountability and reform, although I'm gonna veer off my prepared notes totally. I had the distinct honor my senior year going to Brophy of interning for Senator McCain Laws. Um, he knew that we were a democracy. The man was incredible. He taught me a lot of things. You know, Mayor, I prepared for tonight's uh, speech I read your bio online, and I know, you know, in, in your bio you said you want uh, Peoria to be a leader. We're in a period of time here for the last 18 months that the, that the vast majority of Americans right now support some type of police reform, accountability, and change. 65% of Americans believe that, that's two thirds. 35%, let's look at this the other way. If you guys had a 35% approval rating, do you think you're gonna get reelected? So, you know, McCain was always good at turning numbers into something that was really, that people could really understand. So my problem with this is we live in a nation of laws. All these laws apply to everyone equally, liberty and justice for all, right? I mean, we did, we said the Pledge of Allegiance, yet, we have government that isn't doing the same thing as it's expecting its residents to do. These laws apply to everyone equally. Um, obviously, unless there's an emergency call or something is happening. Government has the, and, and, Senator, and the Senator understood this, the government has the ultimate responsibility to lead, to do the right thing, regardless of what everybody else thinks. And that is, in essence, what's going on here. Um, you know, I expect my government to be moral and ethical, to be respectful and responsible. That is the very essence of what a democracy should be. So they're, off, they're totally unprepared, but um, you know, Senator McCain inspired me a little bit today, and that's just unprepared remarks from my heart. So, and that's why I believe in police reform and accountability. Thank you, have a great night. Thank you, sir. All right. We will now move on to reports from our city manager, Mr. Tyne. 
Great. Thank you, Mayor Council. Just a few items that I wanted to go through. One was um, also to just express my thanks to all of you that have contributed to um, the 67th Avenue improvements from Pinnacle Peak to Happy Valley Road. Uh, kudos to our in intergovernmental staff. Uh, also to those that testified, Mayor Carlid, uh, Dina Lund, our Development Engineering Services, to our legislative support that we had also received. It's just a huge uh, win for us. So just wanted to mention that. With uh, last Saturday was obviously an important day, especially for our Neighborhood and Human Services Department, uh, which while also taking on our Halloween uh, event at the sports complex, also had Neighborhood Pride. Uh, which was an incredibly successful program in the West Green Estates area where over 31 properties were touched. And it was very impressive and a great outreach by the volunteer staff and by our Neighborhood and Human Services staff and other volunteers. So thank you so much for that. Uh, first up, I wanted to also provide a video that is announcing an award of the 2021 Outstanding Facility Award for populations 100,000 and over from the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association. And it was awarded to the city of Peoria for Paloma Community Park. And congratulations to our city staff and agency partners who contributed uh, to this point of pride in the city. And so this uh, video was provided by the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association. And thank you, John Sefton, for helping us with this. Nearly a decade ago, Peoria residents expressed a need for a new park. Residents in the northern area of the city would drive as far as 16 miles for recreational opportunities like youth or adult sports leagues, desert trails, or picnic areas. Peoria citizens and city planners came together to a vision for the city's largest park to date in the 2013 Community Services Master Plan. These efforts converted 85 acres into Paloma Community Park a four season outdoor space that features four lighted ball fields for recreational league play, four lighted multi-purpose fields for recreational soccer and other sports, four lighted pickleball courts, open turf for public use and special events, including outdoor concerts, 3.5 acre fishing lake, which also serves as an irrigation reservoir, splash pad, inclusive design playground, picnic ramadas, lighted dog park in three separated cells, two concession buildings, an overlook plaza with views of the soccer fields, lake, and surrounding mountains, one mile loop trail with distance markers, restrooms, parking. Paloma Community Park blends responsible and functional design with attention to aesthetic detail. Since the park is situated on a site within the New River Dam flood impoundment area, the city and its design team developed a final layout and design that maintained 100% of the flood retention capacity and adhered to both U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Flood Control District of Maricopa County requirements. Congratulations to the City of Peoria and Paloma Community Park, this year's outstanding facility for populations over 100,000. Really appreciate the um, APRA and Hayden Construction for their video, just outstandingly done. So it really was uh, really reflected a lot of what we were trying to accomplish in there. Also wanted to mention on Thursday night, the 21st of October, the city of Peoria was honored with two Westmark Best of the West awards. And the city was awarded for excellence in innovation for the Peoria Ford Partnership with Arizona State University and for the quality of life for our Peoria Community Arts Projects. Thank you so much to Westmark for the recognition, uh, to the judgment staff, and also congratulations to our city staff and community partners who have made these projects such a success. It was a really, really special night. Uh, that is all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Boy, being called best of the best just doesn't get old, does it? <laughs> Thank you for that. We will now move on to um, Comments from our Youth Council liaisons, and we'll begin with uh, Youth Council Liaison Fierro. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, Mr. Tyne did bring up the event last Saturday that uh, 10 members of our board attended, the Halloween Bash at Peoria Complex. 
It was a lot of fun. And most of our committees have now started their first meeting. So we're very happy to get things going. Great. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, it's very lovely to be here. And I'd like to say that we did, um, the board and um, all of us together agreed upon creating a way to bond together by doing volunteer opportunities as a group. And the Halloween bash was our very first one. And I do plan on us doing that every month. And um, yeah, that's what we're doing right now. And especially that our committees are getting together and starting to get working on our goals for this year. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, and there being no further business, we are adjourned.